Welcome to Connex. This week we have Josh Hendricks from uh, Phoenix Builders. Um, and where's your office at, Josh? Uh, our home office is here in Rolling Meadows, Illinois. Okay. Well, um, rather than me tell uh, the story uh, behind Josh, I'd rather him tell. Josh is an old friend of mine, and we used to work together. And uh, uh, he's gone on to to bigger and better things. And uh, so, uh, Josh, tell us about you and your company. Sure. Well, you know, like uh, Scott had mentioned, we've worked together in the past, and uh, my history has been in, uh, you know, the general contracting commercial world here now for 20-plus years. And I was fortunate enough to come to the the Phoenix Builders team here um, in the role of executive vice president probably almost 11 years ago. And uh, Phoenix was founded in 1983 by by two brothers, Tom and Mike Teschner, and we're, we're a privately held corporation. We were in our own 20,000 square foot facility here in Rolling Meadows that we built back in '98, and uh, we we do everything from you know we we fabricate some of our own millwork here. Uh, you know we we like to employ some environmentally friendly friendly uh, building and uh, energy saving lighting, infrared heating systems, and so forth in our shop area. And we we kind of founded ourselves as a full service construction company. We we focus on commercial, healthcare, institutional, um, some retail and that. And we we employ our own trade people. We have carpenters, uh, laborers, drywall hangers, painters, tapers. And right now we're right about fifty employees. So we. Uh, you got a great great team size here. We're we're not uh, we're not the big boys on the block, but uh, you know, we're a good small size company here in Chicago. So let me ask you a question: Why do you guys uh, choose to self perform when there's a lot of people out there not not self performing anymore? You know that's that's a question I constantly struggle with because obviously the overhead, cash flow, the risks involved, but the trades that we perform are are those aspects that our clients are, you know, they touch, they feel, they, you know, a lot of our clients don't have any type of construction background. So when we're performing these carpet, trim carpentry and framing and drywall, a lot of the finishes that they can touch and feel, we're in direct control of, of the emotion and the feeling that they're getting at the end of that project. And I, I take a, a lot of pride in that. And, you know, there's also some pride in, in still, having some of those skilled trade crafts within our, within our umbrella here, you know, we, we are kind of a dying breed and, and that's a service that's kind of sets us apart from our competition. And, and we still, they still bid to us as any other subcontractor does. Um, they operate out of our office. However, they operate under a different uh, um, performance model. They submit a bid to us and, and they aren't always awarded the contract. Uh, we review their scope and pricing just as we would any other contractor but it's nice to have that control when we can utilize our own services because uh, you know if if we're light on manpower or we need to really uh, kick it in gear to hit our finish date i'm in direct control of that so. well you know you, you say it you say a dying breed but it seems to me based on you know talking with different people you guys may be on may be coming back you know uh it seems like people want to have what you said want to have more control uh however there's not very many companies out there anymore that could, you know, manage a self-performance piece of their company. So uh, that, uh, we find, I find at least when talking with different people, mostly like in the uh, utility business, like a great example is, uh, you know, wastewater treatment plants doing self-performance of concrete, you know, because it's such a large scope of what they do and helps them be competitive, a more, little more competitive. Right. Yeah. And that's an aspect of it as well. There, there, it definitely helps us in tight time frames with bidding, you know, because as I'm sure you've experienced is when you're, you're in a short bid window for a client who, for whatever reason, they've got a locked in delivery date and the drawing or entitlement process has taken longer than expected, which shortens that bid window. And you go out to vendors, they, they're going to focus on things where they've got more time and maybe a better opportunity to win the project. 
by self-performing some of those those larger trades, you know, we can kind of buckle down and, and turn a bit quickly and prioritize it in-house rather than rely on an outside vendor to do that. No, that makes sense. Now, you mentioned your core focus a little bit, but can we kind of come back to that? You said, what kind of projects have you guys done in the past or what are you guys really, really, really good at? What's in your wheelhouse? So, you know, originally our wheelhouse has been for a long time, for, you know, over two decades, it's been restaurants. Uh, we were kind of known as the restaurant guys in, in the Chicago market here. And when I came here, I would venture to guess that, you know, 80% of our annual revenue was in the restaurant industry. Since then, we've diversified. You know, when the market kind of fell apart in 2008, 2010, we went through the recession. People stopped going out to eat. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, in order to survive and, and weather that storm, we started focusing on on other market sectors, that being you know, going back to our core roots of senior living and, and assist, you know, assisted independent and memory care facilities. And uh, we, we partnered up with uh, Brookdale Senior Living out of Nashville and kind of grew our business there. And it has since, you know, the storage market here in the Midwest has really grown. And we've, we've capitalized on that as well. And have been, you know, we had a client who we had done some commercial build out work for who decided to get into the development side of storage and gave us a shot. And, you know, we, we employed a lot of our skill set, a lot of our, our performance metrics to that project model and did well. And we've since been able to, to grow in that market base. And now, you know, we, it, it occupies probably the lion's share of our revenue. So how, why is storage a big thing? I mean, that's, that kind of boggles my mind a little bit. Is it just, I mean, what, what in the market has brought that up about? Just space, you know, I mean, especially here in the Chicago market, you know, nobody wants to let go of their items, but, but space is at a premium premium. You know, you get a lot of, uh, uh, the millennials who are now into new jobs in there, but they, they like living that city life and, and, uh, living space is at a premium. So we've got that market base. We have, um, commercial, you know, there are commercial clients out there who, don't want to hold on to their own infrastructure for storage and distribution. Mm-hmm. So they're outsourcing that to whether it be cold storage or temper controlled storage and medical storage. Uh, those are client base as well. And a new uh, product that we've been working on is high end car storage, you know, as opposed to a guy, you know, taking his classic Mustang and putting it in a, you know, a, a pre-engineered metal building out in a cornfield somewhere for paying, you know, a hundred bucks a month on it. We're building these high-end retail type, uh, high-end car storage areas where we epoxy the floors. We do all storefront along a busy, a busy thoroughfare. High lighting. We put a wash bay in and that guy can say, Hey, you know, if you're ever driving down Main Street, you know, at, at one, two, three Main Street, take a look at that red Mustang in the corner there. That's, that's mine. Oh, that's so they're cool. They're able to that's put a, their vehicles on display. That's it. Yeah. That's an interesting concept. Plus, I mean, I know that just from my own cars, having them in a climate controlled, you know, that's a big thing considering how they can deteriorate. And I mean, obviously you're not going to be driving in the snow in a Corvette, you know, uh, or you shouldn't, I should right. say. So, um, so you kind of told us, told us our his, your history, uh, you know, moving it forward, what significant event do you think helped shape the business model you have today? I would say, actually, you know, the recession. The recession is what forces, you know, necessity is the mother of invention. And, and necessity to survive is a great motivator. So, you know, when, when our restaurant industry experience or our restaurant clients stopped doing development projects, we had to uh, to move in a different direction. And the two brothers that started the company um, back in 1983, their mother was a, an executive director for a, a senior living facility and so we kind of fell back on that market. You know, the baby boomers were creating a new market trend there. And we're, we're affiliated with uh, ABC. I don't know if you're familiar with that or not, but Associated yeah. Builders and Contractors. And, and um, it's a merit shop based organization. And Brookdale Senior Living uh, out of Nashville was a strong merit shop supporter, strong ABC supporter who had a large... Uh, uh, need for contract services here in the Chicagoland area. And we were able to take on uh, the first couple of projects with them, execute them successfully, and went on to do uh, eight to 10 more within a, 
you know, 24 to 36 month period. And that seems to be a growing market. I don't know about where you guys are, but it seems to be growing like crazy. Um, uh, but, uh, because that's like a hybrid medical slash living facility, you know, apartment slash medical, you know? So, um, right. And it's, it's ever evolving because of that continuum of care. You're as your population size moves from that independent living to assisted living. And now, the, the market that's really growing is underserved is the memory care and, and dementia uh, mm-hmm. space. You know, so now we're converting, they, they don't have such a need for independent living. So we're converting independent living spaces into memory care and dementia things. So, you know, so for you, um, the, the, you know, you, you, you know, kind of backing up you personally, can you kind of tell, you know, the listeners what, you know, like your history is, because I, I find that a lot of people are interested in like the background of everybody. And I, you got a pretty interesting background, just kind of what you've done. And, and uh, I didn't realize when you said 20 years, I started thinking to myself, gosh, we're old, you know. So, uh, <laughs> but but because but, uh, but, uh, we were young guys working together back in the day. But can you kind of back up, uh, you know, you, you grew up in Illinois and Rockford, right? I did. I, I grew up a uh, uh, low-income family in a trailer park on the southwest side of Rockford, Illinois, which is a, you know, is just a, a struggling market in northern Illinois. And I, you know, I worked in construction starting in junior high, you know, uh, as a laborer on, a, on residential job sites, working for my my buddy's dad, who was a, a residential home builder there. Never really thought that was going to be a career I'd get into, but it, it paid bills. I could hang out with my buddy and and, and learn a good skill set. So through junior high and high school, I did that and knew I wanted to go to school. Uh, parents didn't have the money to send me to school. So uh, they, in Illinois, they had a sp- uh, split option program where you could commit to uh, one of the service branches and do your basic training in between your junior and senior year. And then you would go on to your advanced training following graduation. So at 17 years old as a junior in high school with my parents signing permission, I joined the Army. And uh, I went to my basic training down to Fort Benning, Georgia, in between my junior and senior year. Came back about two days late to start senior year and uh, <laughs> did it, finished it, graduated, uh, had a party the next day. And then I was back on a plane back to Fort Benning the day following <laughs> to go finish the rest of my advanced training. So <laughs> it, was a, it was a full-time job between school and the military. So I was uh, very fortunate. I, I did uh, two-year service and... I, I utilized my GI Bill money to to go to in-state Illinois State School and get my construction management degree and graduate without any college debt and still continued that uh, you know that never quit attitude and and you you know you do what it takes to support your team and help your team and be an integral role player and I did that implemented that in my my personal and professional life and it, it's just paid off for me over the years. You know. Um... I know you're, you know, when I think of people who are planners, I think of you <laughs> because, you know, uh, <laughs> so my next question has to do with kind of how you're preparing for the future, you and Phoenix. Well, it's a uh, two part because, you know, my, I'm in a buyout agreement here at Phoenix. So I've got a short, a very short term uh, plan for both me and Phoenix. And then I've got a longer term plan once that buyout portion is complete. You know, and just like with any any uh, company, leadership plays a large role in that. And our current leadership, uh, obviously, uh, they're in the tail end of that. So they're very risk adverse. Um, whereas, you know, I, I, I like to consider myself younger in the industry. Uh, although, you know, when you sit back and think 20 years, I'm not quite so young anymore. But so in the short term, it's to, to bring on good, solid opportunities, surround ourselves with, uh, you know, great team members build the the IT infrastructure which is a, which is a struggle that I have I got to I recognize that as a weakness of my own I don't feel comfortable with the IT piece so I'm surrounding myself with others on our team who are are very strong in that aspect mm-hmm. and are constantly reviewing and analyzing where we are in comparison to the rest of the market and what can we do to be the best service provider to our clients um and I think that's going to play a big role with our springboard into the future as far, from a revenue standpoint, from a performance standpoint. And, you know, anybody can sit back and say, yeah, I want to grow 15% in X time. 
I'm, I'm more interested in bringing on good customers, good client base, taking care of our, our internal and external customers. Cause our subcontractors are, are our lifeblood. You know, we, mm-hmm. I'm a firm believer, like, like any team, if I take care of them, they'll take care of me. And, and, and the, and the work will then come. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, it, it, what we talk about all the time is this is a relationship game, you know, and me, both me and you, Josh, know that there's people out there who will slit your throat for a dollar, you know, but that's a very mm-hmm. short term mindset compared to the long term benefit. I mean, you know, I I always believe and I think you do, too, Josh, is that if you do the right thing every time, rather you, sometimes you win, sometimes you lose. But at the end of the day, you know, you're still doing the right thing. You know, and that goes a long way with a lot of people. Absolutely. You know, I, one of my, uh, our company values that I make sure I, I preach to our team is we have accountability for our results and the integrity in our actions. And, and to the two key words for that accountability and integrity. And if you can hold on to those two things in every decision that you make, whether it be with your team members, your clients, in your personal life, I, I promise them, and I, you know, it, from experience, that it typically will come out in everyone's favor. Mm-hmm. Not always the not always the easy road. In fact, typically it's not. But the results that come from from holding on to those two core values will pay dividends. Well, you know, I know you've, I know, cause I know you personally, I, I know you've had a lot of successes and, uh, and, and failures in your life. Um, and those are, those are positive for both of us. Can you tell us about some of your biggest successes and some of your biggest failures personally and professionally? Yeah. Yeah. You know, some of, uh, I'll start with, uh, some of my biggest failures cause I think those are the ones that, that keep me looking forward to, to how I'm going to improve moving forward. And that's, uh, you know, holding on to whether it be team members or vendors too long. Um, even when, you know, when you recognize there's failures, you, you kind of want to see the good in people all the time. And mm. sometimes that's at, at a detriment. And I've had, we've been burned on projects in the past where I've, I've tried to hold on and support, be that, 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 that fire team support guy, you know, I'm maybe falling back to my army days, but you know, you, I'm trying to get that soldier to perform, I'm trying to get that subcontractor to perform, knowing full well that perhaps they just they're they're not going to get there. So that's that's been a failure. That you know, moving forward, I, I want to make sure that we uh, we change. You know, the other thing I think I mentioned it earlier, it's just been IT. You know, I don't think that we have stayed on top of technological advances and the best processes and and software packages that are available in the in our construction market and that has left us in the dust so i have over the past you know year here i've spent a lot of time focusing on that and trying to bolster that to make sure that we don't make that mistake moving forward that i'm not relying on my own experiences or my own inhibitions in in that market to dictate where our company goes what what do you think you guys have done well success you know what are your successes I would say our absolute greatest success is the relationship that we have with our clients. And I know that's it, kind of the, <laughs> that's the, everybody's tagline is, oh, we build great relationships. You know, I think that we, one thing that has been a great, great thing, uh, a success of Phoenix Builders is we develop personal relationships with our clients. So every time we're getting on that phone, it's not necessarily Acme and Phoenix not ABC Inc. and Phoenix. It's John and Tim and Dave and Joe. And we, you know, we involve our customers' lives personally because at the end of the day, we all get up and we all put our pants on the same way and we're all going to work and we all have a lot of the same values and worries and concerns in life. And understanding that at the end of the day has has done really well for our team and, and they understand that. And then they get enjoyment. Our team gets enjoyment out of those relationships with our customers and those customers want to continue to work with us. You know, Josh, I use you as a example um, of somebody, a uh, young ambition person. You're not young anymore, but <laughs> when I knew you, you were young, <laughs> a, young, easy, a, easy. young a young ambitious person. And uh, I always use an example as uh, as being a good example of, of uh, somebody that, you know, 
you know, some of my younger folks can uh, can can look up to. So my next question is is what personal advice would you give to one of those young people that was driven like you were? What I you know when when me and you rolled together, how driven we were. What advice would you give them to, to if they wanted to pursue that you know that that executive level position within construction? If you're looking to be successful as an executive, I think that you have got to be humble, but at the same time, you've got to be confident. You know, you have to, you have to know that you're going to make mistakes. You've got to display humility to your customers, to your team members, but at the same time, it is very important that you display confidence as well because they're, they're looking to you for strength, your customers and your team members. They're looking to you for strength. They're looking to you for that confidence, and they want to know that you, too, are, are willing to be accountable for your actions. And they want to see in you that when you act, you're acting out in the utmost level of integrity. And, and you know what's, what's, uh, what's funny about that is, you know, they're, they're, they can almost be opposites in a lot of ways, but they can go together, too. I mean, you can still be humble and confident, you know, and uh, uh, but it's kind of tough when you're a younger, younger man, uh, especially younger man, uh, seems like younger women have a better <laughs> control on humility, humility yeah. and confidence than we do. We're just, uh, we're just out there, tr- you know, trying to be overly confident, uh, uh, at 20 years old with testosterone running strong through your veins, you know? So, uh, but, right. uh, but well, um, I appreciate that. I'm going to go ahead and go to the last question I have here. And these are kind of just like flash questions. It's a a scale of one to 10. What you think uh, is the most important would be a 10 and what you think is of lesser importance would be a one. Um, So I'm going to just throw out some different topics Um, and Mm -hmm. you can expand upon it if you like, or you can just say a number. So the first one is uh, scheduling. Oh, nine. Absolutely. Effective and clear scheduling. I mean, it, it removes so many of the issues. It removes so many problems with uh, clear understanding of how a project is going to move forward. I mean, it's the old uh, that which gets measured gets done. If you don't have a way, if you don't have a thermostat up for your project, how do you know where you stand? How mm-hmm. does your customer know where they stand? How do your vendors know where they stand? What about estimating? Well, you know, there's a lot of ways to answer that. It depends on the type of project you're looking at. Is this a hard bid project? Is it design build? But uh, overall, again, this is, you know, estimating I'm, it's it's an eight or a nine. You know, it's 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 putting that best plan forward. You haven't put a shovel in the ground yet, and you have to know that you've done your due diligence in the scope of work and are applying costs associated with that before you start, starting with that good, solid foundation. Contract administration. Contract administration, you know, six, seven, you know, it, it, they're they're highly important. However, I have had some great project managers who have not been the best at their <laughs> at contract administrative skills. However, they they have very happy customers. They complete their projects on time, and and so I guess it's not as important. And you can surround yourself with with. Uh, with good team members and so forth. And if you understand the project and you've got clear lines of communication, sometimes uh, that can bolster up a weakness in the administrative part. Design. Design, um, again, depends on type of project, but I'd say a five. There are many projects that I've had that have had a terrible design or just an unclear uh, direction as far as what the end goal was supposed to be. However, through experience and open lines of communication with our customer and their team and understanding what their expectations are, we're able to work with poor design or around that to find success. What about uh, contracts? Contracts? Um, I guess I, you know, it's odd to put numbers of these, but I'll say a seven then. Um, kind of like scheduling, kind of like drawings. It's on having a clear and open understanding on the front end of a project removes all those questions, removes potential for conflict later down the road. Well, I shouldn't say removes, reduces the risk for mm-hmm. conflict. Yeah. We all know we, sometimes you've got an ironclad contract and that doesn't remove your, your potential for risk or conflict. But, you know, it's, 
it's important, but having that relationship with those vendors, understanding and, and having those conversations are so much more important than, than the paper, but the paper's got to be there too. What about accounting? Accounting. Well, I guess it depends on if that in, involves payments and so forth, which I would assume it would. And I would say on, in our market, it, it's a nine, you know, it's, it's fuel for the engine. It's, uh, you know, I mean, it's what, it, it keeps the rest of this list reduced. If if there's not a clear and concise understanding on payment, because sometimes you're dealing with vendors who are, are working paycheck to paycheck, and if you're not on top of the accounting portion, sometimes for them you're making billing for them because they're not getting their invoicing in that mm-hmm. time. They aren't able to. Perf- they could. They have all the best intentions, but if they can't afford to pay their people, you're not getting the project done. Selling work. I mean, if it's the act of going out and selling, I would say that's a one or a two. I think that performance bleeds opportunity. Our, the, the work that we're doing now, the work that we've done in the past and the relationships that we're building, that's what's selling our work. That's what's creating the next opportunity for us, not, not out trying to push what our product is. And the last one is leadership. Oh, leadership is a 10. I mean, you can... You can take you can take that bad news bears team and you can turn them into the, the to the victors if you've got strong leadership. But everything else follows with strong leadership, uh, just like everything else can fail with weak leadership. Absolutely. Yeah, we know that one. <laughs> I'll leave it there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But uh, uh, well, hey, I want to give you the last say, Josh. Uh, if you want to say, kind of wrap up anything, I, I do want to say how, how much I appreciate having you on today. And um, you know, I I, uh, I I look back at you know people I had contact with, and you're one of those high quality guys that I can always uh, always po- kind of point to, and uh, I, and it shows with what you've been able to build where you're at today. So I, I commend you on your on, on on the results of what you've been able to pull out, and and more importantly, I commend you on uh, on who you are, because uh, obviously uh, we had some, and, and, and we've all had some demonstrations of poor leadership and poor ethics and and those type of things in our careers um and uh but on the other side of it we've chose to go a different direction to try to do things right and 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 go that now we're not perfect you know i don't know uh, i don't know about you josh but i'm yeah. not perfect you know but but i, I, I i'm pretty- not well we all know what happened to last guy it was perfect so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah there's no joke but uh but you know the the you know the fact is is that uh, you still get up every day and try you try to do your best so i just want to give you kind of the last word yeah, you know, I'm I'm appreciative of the opportunities that have been given to me, and I'm appreciative of the opportunities that our team uh, has created. So now getting an, a, a chance to provide a level of service both to our to our team members and to our customers, it's just uh, it's extremely rewarding. It's it's relationships again. I, some of the greatest relationships and friendships that I have are have been created through this industry, and and. Uh, you know, I, I look forward to the next generation and succession that I'll be able to create and uh, moving forward for this company. And, you know, it's uh, just very rewarding. Well, uh, Josh, I just want to tell, tell uh, you and your family, I hope you guys are doing well. And uh, it sounds like uh, it sounds like you got a busy life. Uh, you got three kids now. Four, four sons. Four, oh my lord, four. Oh yeah. And so, so you <laughs> must. The bathrooms are not clean at my house. You must have done something wrong <laughs> in our life to end up with four boys, but but uh, but <laughs> or does it done something right for that matter? But uh, yeah, I, I don't know. I don't know. There are ten grandchildren, and only one of them's a girl. Boy, she's they just. I think I'll take oh my four God. boys. <laughs> well, you don't have to worry about passing your name on. So. No, I do not. <laughs> Uh, well, thank you once again. And uh, to end uh, Connex today, we'll be back in another week and, and bringing another construction executive online.